So we're going to look at a lot in this lecture, but so basically we're going to start with nutrition during pregnancy and then work our, work our way through infancy and childhood. So there's a lot that we're going to cover. We're going to go over some basics. So this is just a very basic overview of kind of what's happening during pregnancy and really we're going to focus briefly on how that impacts our nutrition. So a couple things you need to know in terms of organs and things. Um, Obviously, the uterus is where uh, the baby is growing on there, but you have to look at a couple of other things in terms of nutrition, which is the placenta, which is that structure that forms within the uterus that's really that's responsible for allowing the oxygen and nutrients um, to get from the mother to the growing baby. You have the placenta then, which is that, or excuse me, that's so you have the umbilical cord, which is what connects the placenta um, to the growing child. So... You can see what that looks like there. Um, some quick terms to look at, and you'll be able to see this um, on the next slide, but consider an embryo two to 10 weeks after conception. After 10 weeks, they'll consider it a fetus. Um, we talk about that terms of gestation time, so how long um, from a time uh, a woman is pregnant until she gives birth. We also can look at the gestational time, which is a term that looks at that. It's different for different animals, the length of time that the pregnancy lasts. Trimesters is how we break down that time in humans into three trimesters. So you can look at this briefly. Again, we're not going to talk too much about that, but you can see what this looks like here as well. Um, and then anything after 37 weeks is considered full term. So how does the nutrient needs to change during pregnancy. So a lot of things are happening. Um, the woman's body is changing. We have increased blood volume, increased energy demands, increased needs of other nutrients, etc. So, you know, there's definitely weight gain. Um, this chart, it's helpful to look at, but obviously everyone doesn't gain exactly 29 pounds. Um, so this is just kind of an estimate. Uh, everyone is different, all that. Um, they also try to break that down into loss sooner after birth and then retained at birth. It doesn't work out exactly like that either, but it's just giving you an estimate of, you know, what some of this weight gain may look like. So some of it's from the baby, body water, extra blood volume, amniotic fluid, the placenta, umbilical cord. That's what they're taking into uh, being lost soon after birth. And then there's extra, often extra fat that's retained for the process. Um, other changes that, you know, obviously aren't something that's lost um, right, like right after birth, just like the baby weight it the actual weight of the baby is on that. Um, there's also this weight gain chart. Again, everyone's going to vary, definitely. Um, and some physicians are more concerned about this than others. And it's also, like we talked about before with weight, it is definitely not the only metric of health. There's lots of other things they're going to be looking at to look at a healthy pregnancy. But this is just an overall guide. Um, and it's based on pre-pregnancy BMI. So essentially where someone was um, before they uh, got pregnant. So underweight, if they were underweight before they became pregnant, the weight gain range is a little bit higher. Um, and then you can see it goes down from there. But again, this is just a guideline. Um, you know, certainly they're wanting to measure normal growth and development of the fetus and make sure everything's okay with the woman's health and all that. And it's going to be a bigger picture that they're going to use to figure out, you know, what's really appropriate. Um, I also have... A lot of friends who will laugh at this and say, you know, it's not, oh, this isn't always 100% in the, you know, it's really not in the control of the woman like that either. So it's not like you can say, I'm going to gain exactly 27 pounds and, um, and that's what's going to happen. So um, you kind of take that with a grain of salt on these. But we do know that, that not gaining enough or gaining too much either can have negative consequences. So this is kind of what I'm just talking about, inadequate weight gain or excessive weight gain. So you can see that Inadequate weight gain um, increases the risk of in unsuccessful breastfeeding of the mother, but it does have a lot of negative effects on the infant, can increase the risk for stillbirth, preterm birth, um, impaired neurological development, etc. And then we do see some consequences of excessive weight gain as well um, during pregnancy that can increase the risk for gestational diabetes or hypertension, um, and it may increase the risk for some things like preterm birth, large for gestational age, etc. for the baby. And there's a lot more research being done about this, um, and there's a little bit in your book, but that looks at, you know, kind of what are the effects long term 
maybe on the, the child related to the mother's weight gain. So there's a lot of things going on about that in the research world. So, you know, why do we look at birth weight? And, you know, that's normally if a baby's born, they'll normally tell you this is how much it weighed. Um, and there's lots of things that we can look at when we're trying to determine health uh, in an infant. So a couple things that we'll, you'll look at, uh, premature means being born before full term. There's a couple other things um, that we look at, like small for gestational age. And I'll show you what that looks like on a chart. But essentially that would be, you know, someone who is, you know, this baby is, was born at 38 weeks, but compared to other babies born at 38 weeks, it is on, is on the small side, so it may be more at risk. Um, and then low birth weight is a set number. So this will show you that here. So this, there's a lot going on here, so bear with me for a second. I'll kind of explain some of the key points for you on that. Um, anything under five and a half pounds, you can see that blue line going across, will be considered low birth weight. Um, and then it's also broken down into the premature, so you see before 37 weeks, the term between 37 and 42, and then post-mature. Normally you won't see it. Um, most of the time, OBs will want to take it before it gets to that 42 weeks, but it's going to, I mean, obviously it's going to depend a little bit on what's going on. Um, but you can see here that the large for gestational age, age appropriate for gestational age, and small for gestational age are color coded. So the small is orange, age appropriate is green, and the large for gestational age is purple. And so we're going to look at two babies on this chart. So baby A. Um, is a preterm baby, so you can see born at about 33 weeks. But they actually are considered age appropriate for gestational age. So, yes, that baby was born premature, and it's probably going to have, you know, there may be some complications at that time. But it was considered, you know, that it was growing appropriately, at least in terms of weight. That's all we're looking at here. Um, appropriate weight for the developmental age, so for when it was born. Whereas infant B was born at full term, but is still considered slightly small for gestational age because it's five and a half pounds, and for babies at about 40 weeks, that is on the small side. Um, it's not considered to be low birth weight. It's over or right at that threshold for uh, five and a half pounds. But you can see how um, there's several things to look at here. So low birth weight's one, um, how their size is for gestational age, and then whether or not they were premature or full term. Again, I know that's a lot there, so don't stress out too much about that part. Um, that's something that, you know, is definitely considered um, a little bit more advanced in the nutrition world, but I wanted to just kind of give you some insight because I think this is interesting to look at these kind of visuals. Um, so what affects that infant birth weight? There's a lot of things. Um, the duration of the pregnancy, the weight status of the mother before conception, weight gain during pregnancy, if the mother smoked. Lots of other things about the health that during the pregnancy that can affect it. So some things that go into a healthy pregnancy, so physical activity, uh, eating well, making responsible choices, getting regular medical care. Um, it's probably not surprising to anyone that a lot of times the risk of complications um, or problems with the infant uh, increase in those who don't get proper prenatal care. So something that we really push. Um, for pregnant women, when we look at calorie needs, uh, you always hear people talking about, you know, oh, you need to eat for two, right? Well, technically, um, you do need to increase your calories, definitely, but it's not normally double the way a lot of people are trying to imply when they try to feed you double of everything. Um, so the recommendation normally is about 340 calories more per day in the second trimester, about 450 calories per day in the third trimester. Um, again, that's just an estimate average, we're all different, um, but that gives you an idea of kind of where that increase needs to come from. Um, if someone is underweight or not gaining weight enough, then they may recommend more. So, you know, they'll, they don't really, they don't recommend counting calories during pregnancy or anything like that. They just recommend monitoring weight, the growth of the baby to make sure that weight gain is adequate and the baby's developing properly, etc. So it's estimated that we need about 15% more in total calories in pregnancy. Again, like I mentioned, that even varies based on the duration, or the duration, but excuse me, where you're at in pregnancy. Um, and there are some nutrients that women need about 50% more of, 
like protein, folate, zinc, iodine, and iron. So those are important. Um, consuming an inadequate amount of nutrients can put the baby at risk, as well as excess amounts. Remember we talked about this a little bit in the dietary supplement and the vitamins chapters, that excess can also be dangerous during this period. So when we look at supplements, um, it's important to follow the advice of the doctor. Uh, and there may be some, like iron is, tends to be a universally recommended supplement. Um, I find most will put on pre prenatal vitamins as well, uh, just kind of a, a backup plan. But essentially, when picking a prenatal vitamin, it's something that someone would want to make sure that they are taking one that doesn't have really high amounts of any nutrient, that's made well. Um, you don't want it to risk taking too much of any nutrient through those vitamin or mineral supplements. Um, someone who's vegan during pregnancy may also need additional vitamin D. They may need even more iron than's recommended for others, um, and they may need to take that supplemental additional vitamin B12 as well. But that's where a dietitian could really come in and, and give some really good insight into that individual's diet and what they may need to supplement during pregnancy. Um, but we do recommend being really careful with herbal supplements, and even there are certain essential oils and things like that that are contraindicated for pregnancy. So these things that we often just think are, are super safe and we don't have to worry about it, anything with them um, could potentially cause problems during pregnancy. So some important nutrients, so folate. If you remember back to folate, um, we talked about how if a woman is deficient during pregnancy, it's often even times before that she knows she's pregnant, it can end up with birth defects and other neural tube problems. So that's an important one. Uh, vitamin A is also important. Uh, we need enough, but it can be teratogenic. So there is an upper limit during pregnancy and too much can cause problems. Um, some medications that contain vitamin A, we'll have to be careful with. And this even um, goes with certain skincare things, certain um, retinol lotions, etc. to be careful with as well. Um, again, iron is the most common deficiency during pregnancy. If you think about just the, the um, you know, physiology around pregnancy and the increase in blood volume that's going on, it makes sense that a woman would definitely need more iron during this. So this is something that really have to uh, monitor during pregnancy. Um, and then again, some other ones, calcium. Uh, calcium uniquely, that 1,000 milligrams per day does not change in pregnancy versus non-pregnancy. Um, but it is super important during pregnancy so much so that your body actually becomes more efficient at absorbing it. So while you do need more during pregnancy as a woman, you're uh, you don't necessarily have to take more in. You just need to make sure you get the proper amount and your body will absorb a little bit more of it. So that's kind of neat how our body works in that way. Um, obviously, the iodine, vitamin D um, are important. There's no official recommendations about omega-3 fatty acids, but there's a lot of research being done on the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids during pregnancy um, on even infant development later down the road. So that's um, a really important nutrient during that time as well. So some issues during pregnancy, and again, we're glancing over this. You could spend an entire three-hour lecture talking about this, but we won't. Um, but some things, morning sickness, nausea and vomiting, and sometimes this can be really severe for women um, and can make it difficult for them to eat enough uh, because they are constantly feeling sick, so that's something that we have to watch out for. Um, it can also be so severe that a woman may need hospitalized for certain periods. Um, pica or pica, depending on how you say that, um, there's a lot of debate about this. Is it eating non-food items? Um, if you haven't heard of it, Google it, and you can see probably see some pictures. Um, this may be a sign of anemia. There's still kind of some debate about um, what it's really saying, but it may be something to, that we see. Um, gestational diabetes, then, is that development of di diabetes during pregnancy. And so it definitely can increase the risk for large for gestational age infant, um, which is why it's tested for. And women, um, if you know anyone who's been pregnant or if you've had a child yourself and you've done the glucose test, that's what they're testing for. Um, and that's, you know, if it's managed well during pregnancy, uh, everything can go great. Just want to make sure that they're testing so that they know that way they can manage it um, and try to minimize any complications. What about food safety? So this is a hot topic. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about food safety in another lecture. 
Um, but specifically during pregnancy, you hear a lot about fish, and you just heard me mention, eat more omega-3s. We think that's really important during pregnancy. Then you also hear on the other side, be careful of mercury. And so, you know, you hear things coming from both sides, and there's really truth in both. Um, omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to be very important in pregnancy. But yes, there are fish that are high in mercury that can also cause problems. So how do we balance that? So typically they recommend 8 to 12 ounces of low mercury fish per week, um, like salmon, cod, shrimp, um, sardines, anchovies, and trout. They recommend limiting tuna to about 6 ounces a week. Um, most tuna is okay, but some of the bigger tunas can have a little bit higher amounts, so they recommend just limiting that. But then avoiding those um, high mercury fish like shark, swordfish, king mackerel, tilefish, and we don't see too many of those um, in where we're at in Kansas, but you know, on the coast, you will see more of those being consumed on a regular basis. So we do like to recommend still having that seafood, but just limiting it. So again, that comes with everything we've talked about, right? You know, even things that are, are good for us and when we have too much can be problematic. So limiting it to um, a moderate amount of low mercury fish, um, and that can be helpful for development. Um, alcohol, there is no safe level of alcohol consumption during pregnancy, can cause fetal alcohol syndrome on that. Um, caffeine's an interesting one, and I've had some people who had children years ago when the recommendation was no caffeine kind of be like, oh man, I wish I could have had this when, when I was pregnant. So I've heard that several times from people. Uh, but the, there is a recommendation to limit caffeine, and the World Health Organization recommends limiting, limiting caffeine below 300 milligrams per day. And the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists recommends less than 200 milligrams per day is what we're recommending for caffeine. So it's not saying none, but it's just trying to limit it, maybe one to two cups a day, depending on the strength of the coffee, et cetera. Um, and you can see coffee, ca uh, soda, they're all going to be a little bit different in their caffeine content. So again, that's going to be a personal decision as well. And then we also worry about some common uh, microbial contaminated foods. So listeria um, is one that we specifically look at um, because it can cause premature birth and miscarriage and have some other issues with the baby. So it's a unique one that really does affect pregnant women in a, in a different way. So some things we recommend women stay away from during pregnancy include unpasteurized cheeses, and that's sometimes even things like a soft goat cheese, um, unpasteurized milks and juices, um, unheated lunch meat, so they'll actually recommend to stay away from like cold cuts unless they're heated, and you have to be careful with that. It's not like a lot of times if you made like a grilled ham and cheese, for example, the meat really may not get warm through, so they recommend, you know, throwing the meat on the griddle or in the microwave to actually heat up before making that. Um, pate, other meat spreads, things like that that are going to be high risk. Um, we have seen listeria in some fruits and some other things in the last several years. Uh, so in a couple chapters, we'll look at the food safety, and I'll show you a little bit more examples of where we've seen listeria. But it is something to watch out for because that, that specific bacteria can have extra effect during pregnancy, although so can any infection, right? We want to try to stay away from those things during pregnancy as much as possible. Uh, so foods to avoid, this just kind of goes through everything. Um, unpasteurized milk and cheeses. This is undercooked chicken and poultry, which really we should all avoid all the time, undercooked chicken. Um, so, so this isn't, I, I always, some people will mistake this and say that you shouldn't have chicken during pregnancy. That's not what this says. It's just you shouldn't have raw or undercooked chicken. Um, those high uh, mercury fish or alcohol beverages. And then some things to be cautious with, deli meats, hot dogs, tuna, Raw fresh produce, this isn't telling you not to eat produce during pregnancy. We actually know that's really important, but you just want to make sure that you're um, getting from safe sources and that your produce isn't contaminated. All right, so after birth, um, we'll briefly talk about lactation and breastfeeding here. There's a lot of hot topics about this. We've heard a lot more about breastfeeding and breastfeeding in public and lots of things that's been on the news in the last several years. Um, but essentially, lactation has a really high increased energy need, and that's even higher than during pregnancy. The current recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics is breastfeeding exclusively through the age of six months, 
and then continue breastfeeding until one year or beyond while introducing solid foods at around six months. So this just gives some image of how the milk is produced. Um, so what is breast milk made up of? So it's really our nutrients, water, carbs, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Um, there's also antibodies to fight infections, enhance, hum enhance hum immunity, excuse me. Um, you'll, there have even been women who've posted pictures of breast milk. Um, here's what it looked like last week, especially if they're pumping and they could store it. And then um, if an infant is sick, then, and they pump at that, around that time where there's, you know, different things going on where they're looking at that, they can show that the milk actually may change colors or look different because the body's trying to fight immunity, or excuse me, enhance immunity on that. So lots of things to think about. Um, I'm not too worried about you understanding the difference between fore milk and hind milk, but it's just, um, hind milk, once that comes in, has more fat, so it's a higher content, but they're going to be just a little bit different. So what's the, the benefits, reduced risk for the infants, reduced risk of um, obesity, some research says, potentially ear infections. Um, there may be a risk with food allergies. Um, again, it's interesting to look at. Same thing with diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease. So we're, we're learning a lot of these things still. Some of the, the evidence isn't great for these, but they're, they're looking more into it. Um, for the mother, maybe reduced risk of diabetes, breast cancer, etc. So there's lots of, of theories um, that's going on with that. Um, but there are a lot of conditions that may pre preclude breastfeeding, HIV AIDS, um, alcohol, drug addiction, cancer, other things like that. There's also just, I, I kind of think your book oversimplifies this as well a little bit because there's lots of other things that make it really difficult for women to breastfeed and not, these are kind of looking more at some of the social things and attitudes, but there's also Lots of other things where women aren't able to make enough supply. Um, lots of things going on uh, that may just make it a, not a possibility for that individual. The infant may have allergies, so that infant may not be able to have breast milk and may need special formula. So, you know, again, there's in health, there's really no one-size-fits-all solution. So formula, again, is um, a great nutrition, nutritious addition or replacement for breast milk. Um, it's designed for infants. It's designed to mimic breast milk. Um, some, there, some things to think about is it doesn't have the antibodies that breast milk may have. Um, but there are great, there are great formulas out there that can really meet the needs of, of infants, especially with certain health conditions in a way that breast milk may not for that infant. They may not be able to take breast milk. So there's lots of, of options out there. Um, so they recommend either breast milk or formula for the first six months exclusively. Um, they will also give a vitamin D supplement to breastfed infants for that first six months. Formula fed infants have that um, vitamin D supplemented in the formula. They recommend starting to introduce solid foods around six months. So start at six months. Sometimes you'll see four to six months on that. Um, and again, it's going to depend on the development of the child. They also recommend continue breastfeeding or formula feeding up to 12 months with that complementary solid foods being added. Um, an interesting thing about from one to two years, they really don't gain much weight. Um, they do for the first year, definitely. And then they tend to kind of grow for, uh, lengthwise from one to two and don't gain that much weight. So their, gro their growth definitely goes in cycles. If you've had children, you know that. Um, but it's definitely something that, you know, ebbs and flows for sure. So this kind of shows you a few things here. Um, one interesting thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is that immediately after birth, an infant normally loses about 5 to 10% of their birth weight. And a lot of times that really freaks people out, but it's normal. Um, so, but, but what you want to see is by about two weeks, they've slowly started to gain weight again. Um, you can, and uh, they'll try to get them back to their birth weight as kind of an initial marker for that. From birth to six months of age, a baby may grow a half inch to an inch a month. Um, and typically, a baby will double their birth weight between four and six months and then actually triple it by about a year. So you can see what that looks like here. Um, so when do we introduce solid foods? So again, you're, this is something that I definitely think um, 
dietitians and pediatricians specifically can really help with, um, especially now that doesn't, I'm not saying every infant needs to see a dietitian, but um, pediatricians are really good about kind of giving some insight, but if there are special nutrition needs, um, a pediatric dietitian can be really helpful with that as well. Typically, they'll start often with a rice cereal, um, oatmeal, barley cereal, something like that. Those cereals tend to be iron fortified, and by that time, the infants really start to need kind of an iron source in their diet. Um, about six to eight months, that's where you get the strained vegetables and fruits. Um, your book says 100% fruit juice. Uh, I don't see a lot of people really loving that juice during that time period. Um, strained or chopped meats, cooked mashed beans. Um, by eight to ten months, they're really starting to eat more things like soft crackers, cottage cheese, um, egg yolk, yogurt, that kind of thing. Um, but by 10 to 12 months, they really are eat, can eat mostly t table food in small pieces. So it, it really definitely varies. Um, but we want to make sure that, you know, when they're progressing, that you avoid things that are choking hazard, that foods are, like I said, when we're we're starting with strain, pureed, um, mashed foods, and then working your way up to like a soft cracker or something that will dissolve and then small pieces of table food to prevent choking. We actually really try to avoid some of these common foods um, with toddlers because they are choking hazards, so nuts and seeds. That's not saying, um, all people take this to mean like peanut butter, and that's not what it means. It's meaning really the choking hazard of eating the nuts itself, um, like a raw carrot or something like that. Same thing goes with apple pear slices, so really unpeeled raw fruits and vegetables that are hard like that, popcorn, Want to avoid whole grapes are definitely a choking hazard if you think about the shape of a grape and that would get swallowed whole and sit in the in the throat that could cause choking. Same thing with hard candies, dried fruits, large chunks of meat or cheese, and the hot dog is a big one on that. That can also be a choking hazard size. So something like a grape or a hot dog, um, just need to make sure it's really cut up. It may sound strange to cut up your grapes, but for uh, toddlers, it's really what needs to be done to ensure that it isn't a choking hazard. Um, we're not going to talk too much about this, but if you're interested in cord clamping, there's some research going on, so you can uh, look at that a little bit more. So if you haven't seen one of these charts, and if you haven't really been to a pediatrician with a child in a while, you may not have, um, but these are um, height and weight for age percentiles, and often this is our growth charts that we'll look at um, to really see growth of a child. Now, this isn't necessarily looking at, um, you know, where someone should be because we're all different by age. Everyone's a little bit different. But what it's going to show you is the percentiles. And so what that's going to do is, is kind of give some indication of where they fall in the growth curve. You may hear that people talk about, oh, my kid's 90th percent for height or weight or whatever. Um, and really, a lot of times by the time someone establishes on a growth chart, so um, I think you're here a little bit different, but often by age two, two to three, you should be on that same trajectory, and that can be a sign if something's potentially going wrong. So if a child at age two is 90th percentile in weight and height, and then at age three, they're suddenly at 50th percentile, well, this doesn't necessarily mean anything's wrong. It's kind of an indication, hey, is something going on? They're not on their growth curve. That doesn't mean the child at 50% isn't healthy they, at all. Um, it's just saying that that child moved from 90 to 50%, and that's a cause for alarm. If the child was at 50% both times, that wouldn't be a cause for alarm. So if they're not kind of staying within their um, growth curve, doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong, but it is an indication that um, there could potentially be something wrong, and so they'll look into that a little bit more. Um, this is the same thing with BMI. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so what are our children eating? So this is kind of a fun um, little chart, or maybe not fun, depending on how you look at it, but it makes us think, at least, that maybe they're not eating as well as they should be. So diet quality scorecard, we'll look at uh, total fruit, um, total vegetables, grains, greens and beans, dairy, protein, and seafood and plant proteins, we're all a little bit under, where they should be, um, and empty calories were over. So... Um, we do see more kids eating higher amounts of those SOPAs and empty calories um, and maybe not getting enough of their nutrients, especially things like whole grains, uh, greens and beans, and total vegetables may especially be low. 
So a couple of programs that we have in the U.S. Um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act in 2010 um, issued new dietary guidelines. Um, these have changed a little bit. So there have been lots of ups and downs um, with this. But essentially they were trying to increase fruits and vegetables, whole grain rich food, um, limit calories to a reasonable level, and reduce saturated fat and sodium, particularly in school lunch. So these are some guidelines. Again, things have even changed a little bit since then, so I'm not going to talk too much about this. If you um, are really interested in it, I'd be happy to provide you more. We do talk about this um, some in a couple of our other dietary manager courses, uh, but this just gives you a guideline of some of the things they were trying to change in the guidelines for school lunches. So the nutritional recommendations for children, we use the MyPlate. It's really not that different. Um, there may be different portion sizes, et cetera, but it's the same general concept in nutrition that we were talking about for adults most of this chapter, or excuse me, most of this course, you've seen that. This will give you a few things that look at that the energy uh, required to support growth is really significant in the first uh, six months of life, and then growth is just a smaller percentage of our total energy needs. Um, it, you can kind of see when you look at the next chart that teenage years where boys and girls are fairly similar and then it splits off and boys tend to then um, in the late teens require more daily calories, um, significantly more than um, girls on that. So the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges, if you remember we looked at them for adults, they're not that different for children but slightly. Um, please don't try to memorize these. I just want you to know that it is fairly similar, but there are a little bit differences. Um, specifically, especially young kids, they'll recommend more fat, which is why often when they switch to milk after the formula or breast milk for the first year, if that's when they switch, they do whole milk up until age two or three um, because they do need a higher content of fat at that time. So this gives you some MyPlate recommendations for children. We are going to be doing an assignment with this, so um, hold on to this slide. You can look at it. You can also look this up in your book as well, um, but it gives some insight. So if you could, you said, I've got a six to eight year old I'm looking at, you could kind of see about what their needs are um, if you're trying to plan some meals for them. So there's a lot that goes into shaping the eating behaviors of children. If you have children or you have close children in your family or friends or you've um, kind of been around them eating, you can see there are lots of things that affect it. The behavior is influenced by physical and social environments. Um, I've even really found peer pressure and sometimes in a positive way works with these kids and not necessarily intentional. But when I used to do community education, let's say we did a group class at a library and we read books and talked about new vegetables and the, the kids got to try them. Um, a lot of times their parents were like really impressed that they tried them because they wouldn't try them at home. But since the other kids around were trying them, they tried them. So sometimes that definitely plays a role in what they're wanting to eat. Um, but we do recommend that parents control access or control access to foods, timing and location of meals and environment surrounding meals, but then let the child choose if and how much to eat on that. Um, there's a lot of, of emotions and things around food, and um, it's definitely something that we have to be careful about as adults um, because, you know, we may have been in that, oh, clean your plate generation, and sometimes that can lead to not necessarily always the greatest uh, relationship with food, or they may feel like they have to overeat if they're not really hungry because it's on their plate, especially when the parent's making their plate. Um, and kids go up and down. They go through growth spurts. If you've had kids, you'll know that. Um, you know, with my um, nephew, I remember when he was, you know, like three or four, you know, there'd be some times where he wouldn't hardly eat anything. And then there'd be some times where I swear he had one of three breakfasts before, before 10 a.m. He just was, you know, growing, growing, lots going on. He was really hungry that day. And so it really does vary. And so we really should try to allow children um, in some regards to kind of control how much food that they're eating. Um, again, we can control what's access. That doesn't mean give them free reign to eat all the candy they want. Um, but if we're sitting down for a meal, kind of allowing them to pick how much food they want to eat. Again, general recommendation, everyone's a little bit different. There are a lot of jags, so particular way of eating, 
lots of things that happen. Um, you know, so one day they like a food, but the next day they don't. I remember another one with my nephew, who's actually a really great eater as a, um, a toddler and young kid. But one time he was probably four, and we made fruit kebabs for a, a family party we were having. And he was like, I don't, I don't want to eat them. I don't like kebabs. And he likes every single fruit that we put on that kebab. But he just, he said he does not like kebabs. So, you know, you just kind of have to laugh at it and say, okay, you know, it, it is what it is. And don't, but you'll, you'll, if you've been around kids a lot with eating, you'll see how that works. Um, and it can be very frustrating to parents. So we have to, you know, be careful and learn from that. Some nutrients of concern during childhood, calcium, iron, fiber, vitamin D. Those are just things that they may not get enough of. Um, another thing we'll see is childhood obesity. And there's a lot of um, things that we could talk about with this, but we're not going to spend too much time on the specific topic. But we do see children who are obese um, are at increased risk for high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, asthma, other um, chronic diseases, so things that we need to be aware of. Um, but we also need to know that certain uh, stigma and weight loss diets and other things that um, happen uncontrolled in and children who may be overweight or obese may also have some negative consequences, even if they're well-intentioned, they could lead to eating disorders and other things like that. So it, it, this is something that needs to be approached from a professional standpoint. So this will give you some indication of what that looks like as well. So the last thing that we're going to talk about in this chapter is food allergies. Um, and they briefly throw it in here because we associate food allergies with kids. It's not just with kids. Um, I know a lot of adults who've developed allergies during adulthood. So something to think about. An allergen is an immune response. Um, a food intolerance then is something like lactose intolerance, just really where you um, have something different, but it's not a true immune response to the food. So this gives you some ideas of how this happens. So since it sensitization, the first exposure of a food allergen, the immune system of a susceptible person makes a specific immunoglobulin E um, antibodies to that allergen. So the immune system sees it as a foreign invader, makes antibodies to that. Um, when the next exposure of the same food happens, the allergen binds to those antibodies and that can release massive amounts of chemicals like histamine and cause other symptoms like hives, respiratory problems, GI itching. There's lots of things. It can also be um, life-threatening anaphylaxis. So it could be just annoying little itch to life-threatening anaphylactic. And some things that are scary with that is that you don't necessarily know. Someone could have an allergy, a food allergy, and it just normally causes them hives, but then it gets worse, and all of a sudden it's causing really severe symptoms. So this is definitely something we have to watch for. Um, it's really important to understand um, if you work in the food industry or just have friends with food allergies, you really need to think through where foods are stored, what's in them, etc. So it's important to look at. There's no cure. Um, however, there may be some people who grow out of are desensitized. Um, there have even been some research with kids with peanut allergies on trying to expose them to that to see if that improves it. Um, there's lots of research that we're looking at in terms of developing food allergies, what's causing it. Um, they used to think that delaying introduction of foods like peanut butter, for example, was best. Um, but more research recently has come out that makes us think that actually introducing some of these foods like peanut butter earlier on, I mean, obviously when it's safe to do so, so, you know, you don't want to give a one month old peanut butter. Um, but when they're starting to introduce solid foods, that, that may potentially decrease the risk of developing allergies. So there's lots of unknowns in the food allergy realm as well. But it is important that things are labeled correctly, that we uh, think about cross-contamination. And we'll talk a little bit about this uh, when we talk about food safety. But here are the top eight allergens. And these are all ones that are, are um, on the food label. So they must be labeled if it contains these. So milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. These are eight separate allergens. Some people can have more than one. So some people could be allergic to peanuts and tree nuts, but some people may be allergic to peanuts, but be able to eat tree nuts just fine. So don't make assumptions on that. Always ask when in doubt about an allergen. It is very important 
Um, like I said, we're going to look at this a little bit more because this is such a hot topic and something that is very important, um, not just for people in the food industry, but for everyone who may be serving anyone else food. Um, so keep that in mind, um, and we will talk a little bit more about food allergens later. Thank you.